Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Sidney Altman, who is the Sterling Professor of Molecular, Cellular, and Developmental Biology and Chemistry at Yale University. He received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1989 and is the 2010 Hitchcock Professor at Berkeley. Professor Altman, welcome to the campus. It's a pleasure to be here. Where were you born and raised? Montreal. And looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? That's uh, <clears throat> a difficult question in terms of shaping my thinking about the world. Um, I think they're very focused on education as the path to improvement. They were essentially penniless immigrants to Canada, and they felt that education was the path to the future. In terms of, let's say, social interactions, I grew up essentially in an immigrant community with uh, values that uh, have been talked about in many different contexts. Uh, it was a Jewish community, and we had all the appropriate uh, social and cultural values of that community. And, and books were very important, reading? Did they open a, a world up to you? Uh, yes, they certainly did, and uh, reading was extremely important to me. As soon as I learned how to read, which was fairly young age, I was obsessed with reading. Uh, occasionally, we went to the local public library to pick up books that my mother and I went. Uh, and there was no inhibition to uh, doing that or to acquiring more books. There weren't too many books in our house, actually. My mother's father was a rabbinical scholar, and he taught uh, that in a uh, parochial school in Montreal until, I don't know, he was perhaps in his 60s when he stopped doing that. Uh, and uh, anything that I wanted in terms of books, if it was not expensive, we usually managed to get one way or the other. And so that went on for the rest of my life. And reading is still my main hobby, I would say. And were you reading about science, or were there other things that turned you on to the possibilities of being a scientist? I wasn't reading about science. Uh, I was reading anything I could get my hands on. The culture that I was being brought up in, and I'm not talking about the Jewish culture, was, of course, a new one for our family, and my parents were working in that culture, but uh, I had to learn about it, too. Uh, I can... There were some aspects of science involved, and I remember reading at one time a, a book that maybe I was five years old when I was given it about um, various famous people, and. There were a few scientists there, and then the prominent one, of course, was Albert Einstein. And then I think uh, we had uh, some encyclopedias around when I was a little older. My brother was three years older than I was, so perhaps when I was seven or eight, we got uh, a set of the Book of Knowledge, which you may be familiar with, mm -hmm. maybe not. And I just read through it from time to time and uh, maybe picked up some things about science. In fact, I know I picked up some things about science, and there were thoughts of my own about what goes on in nature. And uh, I would say it was when I was perhaps 12 or 13 when I began to read a little in a little more focused fashion about science. And uh, did you have any teachers before you went to college who, who really sort of turned you on? To, to science uh, beyond what you had been reading? Absolutely not. <laughs> okay. Uh, my teachers were regular, unremarkable teachers. Mm -hmm. And what about events in the world that, because uh, you were, you must have been about seven when, six, uh, six when the war ended, yep. and talk a little about that, because did that have an effect, even as a young person, what you could pick up in the, in the papers about what science had done with the atomic bomb? Absolutely. There were, let's say, two events which uh, were 
important in terms of uh, increasing my interest in science. And one of them was the ending of the war in Japan and the atomic bomb. And I clearly remember pictures in the Sunday newspaper that came out very shortly after the bomb was exploded of a picture of a bomb explosion, and it probably was a picture of what happened in, uh, at, the, at the test site in New Mexico. Uh, but there was a lot written about the bomb and the function that science has played in developing uh, atomic weapons and principally how it related to Albert Einstein's work. So I figured that was important and I figured nuclear physics was important. And uh, I should say the war was a very important uh, event or a series of events in my life because my parents, uh, my father uh, listened to the radio every day to the news and I was there and there was a lot of discussion of the war in, in our house. And then when I was 12 or 13, I was given a book which uh, was a very good and interesting book and still exists, I believe. It certainly exists in libraries. Uh, and I think it may, ex it, I'm not sure if it is in print or not right now. It was called Explaining the Atom by Selig Hecht, who was I later found out a professor at Columbia, maybe he said it on the book, but I didn't realize it till later. Uh, and that was explaining uh, what the properties of an atom were, uh, what the structures were, what the periodic table was, and to some extent a little bit about, I think it said something about the making of the bomb. But it was written for lay people and I found it uh, perfectly understandable. And I found it quite exciting, too, especially the description of the periodic table. Uh, and then what, uh, what led you as a Canadian to think about going outside Canada to do your undergraduate work? Well, in fact, virtually everybody I knew did their undergraduate work at McGill in Montreal, and nobody left home to go to the university, nobody that I knew anyway because to go to the States cost a lot of money and we weren't, I, in fact, I never, never even thought of going to the States. But a friend of mine in high school wanted to study aeronautical engineering and they didn't offer it at McGill. And he said, well, I'm applying to an American school. Why don't you just keep me company and apply with me? And the first step in that application was to take the SAT exams, which we normally didn't do in Canada. So we sort of registered to take the SAT exams and one Saturday afternoon we went down to McGill where there was a room reserved for that. <coughs> Excuse me. And we took the exam. And later I found out uh, that I got into, as it turned out, MIT and he didn't, which was unfortunate <laughs> for him. Uh, and that was the only school we applied to and I knew very little about it until we got, uh, we ordered whatever material they were sending out and I read about it and it sounded uh, like a pretty exciting place. So uh, we, in, in our family, we reached another crisis when the letter came admitting me because it was clear I was going to go to McGill <clears throat> at no cost whatsoever. And the question is, could we afford to send he essentially to MIT. At that time, MIT didn't give any uh, scholarship aid to foreign students, and we were definitely foreigners in Canada. Uh, so for essentially the only time that I can remember, my parents and I sat down and had a serious discussion about what should be done. And my father ultimately agreed that I should go and uh, I should do my best to win a scholarship. So I went. And uh, how different was America from Canada back then? And, and what, what, what was MIT like as a, as a place for somebody who had led a relatively sheltered existence in Canada? Well, I think you, first of all, you have to separate the two questions. One is MIT, the other is Canada and the U.S. I, although I grew up in a certain community, I don't think I led a sheltered life. Mm. 
uh, it was a different time, and you could, you know, kind of. Uh, Montreal was a big city. Uh, I believe there were over a million people in the city at that time, or very close to a million. Now it's much larger, and you could travel everywhere. As a child, you got on a bus or a streetcar, the streetcars in the streets at that time, and literally you could travel all over the city and and uh, you told your parents where you're going to go and approximately what time you're going to be back, and that was no problem at all. So I saw a good part of what was going on in the city, and certainly when I was in the high school, I did my best to uh, appreciate what was going on in the city, and, uh, and especially with respect to the French culture. Uh, we, although I wasn't an, an essentially an English-speaking family growing up, um, we learned French at a very early age in school, and um, I was interested in that. I took part in as much as I could in the culture and in street fights along the way. <laughs> so, Which I guess was useful when you became a scientist later. Uh, I, actually, you're more than correct. Stand uh, for what you, you think is important stand and figure out how to get the advantage in some ways. Uh, so I, it, it wasn't as if I, uh, I'm speaking out of turn right now, it wasn't as if I approached my scientific career as uh, one long fight of one kind or another. But there were situations where um, there were various events that impinged on me that, that uh, arose my supposed fighting instincts, and we can talk about that later. So that's one aspect. Now, uh, with respect to coming to the States, life was pretty similar in Canada and the States. However, there were differences in our education, too. I, I would say that I learned things in high school which they paid no attention to. And this had to do with matters outside of the United States. They knew nothing about essentially what was going on outside of the United States. The students at MIT? Yes. Yeah. 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 And, hmm. uh, and they knew things in high school. They went a little further than I did in high school, and uh, I had to catch up there. But I also was a year younger than the other students. We only had 11 grades of, high, of school in, the, in Quebec at that time. Uh, I found MIT to be almost from the first day, a very exciting place. And initially it was because of the students. Every student I met was very uh, smart in many different ways. And they were all, some of them were uh, slightly crazy in, in a good sense. Uh, one could lead one's life with a tremendous amount of humor there. Uh, so, Day to day, there was a lot happening, and it was very stimulating. And of course, then there were the teachers who were quite good, uh, so that was no problem at all. And as time went on, uh, and one made more contact with the faculty, it was apparent that you could learn a lot. And you majored in physics. physics. Yes. And, but then toward the end of your, uh, uh, sort of at the last couple semester, you, you took a course in biology and microbiology, or? No, um, in the last semester of your senior year, uh, you knew you were gonna graduate. You had enough credits and all that, and uh, so you could sort of fool around and do whatever you want. There was a new course, and it was called, I think, biophysics or something like that. It was mm -hmm. taught by Cyrus Leventhal, who had recently come to MIT. And it was a very elementary survey of modern biology. And up to that point, there was no real modern biology at MIT. It was sort of a classical biology subject. And this would be what year? But, uh... That would be the spring of 1960. Mm -hmm. Um, so this would, this told you something about DNA and RNA and process of information transfer in cells. Uh, and it was a short course, it wasn't too deep, but I did learn something about biology from that. 
Mm -hmm. and, and well, molecular biology, mm -hmm. put it that way. Mm -hmm. And then your your so so physics was an important foundation, but uh, I guess the MIT education and your background prepared you to to sort of look at new and different pathways. Well, I can't say that I wouldn't have done that anyway, but the MIT certainly enhanced that considerably. Mm -hmm. And I think the, uh, what you graduated with, with uh, from MIT was an idea that uh, the whole world was out there and you could go out and challenge it in any way. And to some extent, it, that led to a little bit of over, overconfidence, I think, which was probably not uh, appropriate, but it made you do things that you wouldn't ordinarily do. Let's talk now about being a scientist. You made some references to that earlier. And, and uh, uh, first, the, the first question that comes to mind, what, what do you think are the, are the skills uh, and the knowledge base that, that you need to be fluent in to then make these choices about which direction you want to go? Well, I can tell you a little bit about what was important to me, and some of it comes from MIT. Um, I think that one thing you learned at MIT, and perhaps one had a reservoir from that that was sort of untapped, was the feeling that you had to look carefully at everything happening in the world around you, and especially in whatever science you were doing, and treat it with a certain amount of deliberate hard judgment. Also, uh, another thing that I learned was to be careful about taking data. You took data and you looked at it carefully and you didn't throw any of it away and it could all be useful. Uh, I think as a graduate student I learned more about being very hard-nosed about looking at the problems you were interested in. And I, that I took from my um, PhD supervisor, mm -hmm. who and, insisted on that. And, and who was that? I mean, was he a, a influential in, in pushing you in the direction you finally went? No. No. No, the direction I finally went in was a, a resulted from a serendipitous number of happenings. Uh, but the person who was, uh, I wound up doing my thesis actually in Colorado at the, in a de small department of biophysics at the medical school in Denver. And the person who, my super, um, who was my supervisor is Leonard Lerman, and he was a student of Linus Pauling's at Caltech. So he was a pretty serious guy mm -hmm. in terms of science. He was an ex still is an excellent scientist. Uh, I don't, I don't know what you want from me, where I should continue from there. Well, I, I, I mean, I, it's intriguing the, the extent to which you move across these fields, and I'm, I'm curious as to, uh, d does this suggest that a basis in all of these sciences become important as the sciences converge, or is it really up to the individual to draw on what his background is in terms of what he studied? I think it's up to the individual, really. But in fact, I went to Columbia in uh, graduate school in physics, and uh, I didn't like it at all. Mm -hmm. And that became apparent in my second year, where I quit after the first semester. I had done a very, I thought, pretty, I, I had a great time, and uh, I thought I did a good job on my senior thesis at MIT. And I wanted to be an experimental scientist, and there was just no opportunity to do that at Columbia. Nothing that I was aware of, anyway. And it seemed to me that I, have to, I would have to wait for three years and take courses in the meantime and pass exams before I got to that point. And I got a little upset by that, and I quit, probably before they kicked me out. Mm -hmm. And I went home and uh, tried to get involved in the world of writing in different ways. And then somebody who had been one of my professors at Columbia remembered I could write and got, uh, called me up and got me a job as a science advisor, a uh, science writer. Hmm. 
for a new institute in Boulder, Colorado. And he indicated that I could attend the summer institute in physics there, so I went out there. And uh, I had a job. I attended the summer institute in physics. I took courses in physics. It was all very refreshing, I should say. And I, uh, by that I mean the whole atmosphere towards going to school was completely different from the East. Students seem relaxed and happy. Hmm. Um, so I did those things, and uh, during the summer, I met George Gamow at a party. He was a very famous physicist. I don't know if you know the name. He wrote several books uh, that were sort of science fiction. They were the Mr. Tompkins books, uh, and the Fantastic Voyage, a movie which was very successful was essentially plagiarized from one of Gamow's books and um, he was fighting it in court at that time and he won, he won that battle. Anyway, he was a very interesting and exciting person. He was a Russian emigre, constantly in fear that the NKVD was after him and he was a confirmed alcoholic. I learned all, partly all of this because I became friendly with his son and daughter-in-law while I was there. And uh, I met Gamow at a party, and I had perhaps knew at some point that he made some contribution to understanding something about DNA. And in fact, he had contributed an interesting idea, so we were just talking at the party. And um, he suggested that I was interested in these things, I should contact the Department of Biophysics in Denver and just go down and speak to them, which I did. And on that afternoon, I met Leonard Lerman, and by the time we'd finished talking, hmm. uh, we more or less decided that I would become his student. Which then led you on the path that you took. Now, uh, what, what are I, I should say that these essentially were my decisions. Right, right. So, so it was a, a, a finding in your environment the things that interested you and, and well, the, yeah. The, the, the appropriate environment for learning something, which I felt I did not mm -hmm. have at Columbia, and in this small department I felt it was there, and then pursuing something that it seemed was interesting. Now what about the character of a scientist? What, what are, what are the, the, the virtues, the qualities? Uh, you, you made reference to that earlier. Let's talk a little about that, that, that uh, make the problem solver that you are uh, uh, strengthened uh, in, in this process? Well, I would say that there are some <clears throat> common properties that one can refer to, uh, which must exist in most scientists. But aside from that, scientists are just the same general part of the population as any other sample of the population is. And uh, it took me a little while to realize that. I thought science was uh, a little bit above the rest of the population in terms of its respect for good and evil and uh, honesty. <laughs> and I learned that wasn't true. But the fact is what you just described is real. You have to be a problem solver. You have to have uh, discipline and control and perseverance, and in, all with capital letters. And curiosity, I guess. Yes, cer certainly. Mm -hmm. Some people are guided more or less by that, but. Uh, let's, let's talk now about the, the work that won you the Nobel Prize, the, you were a co-recipient of the prize. Uh, what, what problem were you dealing with and, and what were you looking for uh, that led to uh, that work? Uh, perhaps the most important part of all of that uh, was accidental. I wasn't looking for what I found. And so I can dismiss various schools of philosophy, popular schools of philosophy, just by that statement. Uh, I did not have a genuine logistical path that led me one way or another. I was working on the purification of a certain enzyme, which I discovered because of other work I had done when I was a postdoc in England. And 
we were trying to further the purification along when I went to Yale as a, an assistant professor. And our first unexpected finding was that the enzyme had an RNA substrate, as an RNA, excuse me, an RNA um, a subunit as one of its components. And that in itself was highly unusual and it took a certain amount of um, experimental diligence to prove that, mostly supplied by one of my graduate students, uh, Ben Stark. And then it took it even more uh, of my character to survive the assaults of various colleagues in the general community to try and get it published. And let, let's explain that a little. So you, you were working with RNA, uh, is, is that correct? Uh, and and it, help our audience okay. recall to them what RNA is, yeah. Well, <clears throat> uh, I think most people have some inkling of what DNA is. That is, DNA is the material in your cells which contain genetic information. And DNA generally appears as a double-stranded helical structure, very long, and there are monomeric subunits in the structure, and the sequence of the monomeric subunits indicates what the information is that's carried. RNA is not a double-stranded structure, it's a single-stranded molecule that looks very much like DNA, but is chemically different in certain ways. But it has the same capacity to carry information. And I was looking at a certain species of RNA at that time, and the enzyme I found was capable of cutting that piece of RNA in a very specific place. So it was interesting from the point of view of understanding how this RNA got uh, used by the cell, the one that's what we call a substrate for the enzyme. And of course, there was some further interest in understanding this new enzyme which we found. And, and uh, what I would like to clarify is the conventional wisdom at the time was that RNA was only a carrier of information. That was all, uh, that right. was its function. Absolutely. And, and to go against that notion was uh, revolutionary in a way. Well, uh, first of all, we showed, as I said, that the, uh, the, the enzyme R ribonuclease P, which is what I was working on, had an RNA subunit. So that, that in a sense, was the first uh, distinction that we drew. So it meant that the RNA had some function, uh, seemingly had some function other than information. But that's all we knew at that time. And then about six years later or so, six or seven years later, we showed in our lab one of my postdocs, who was a brilliant, absolutely brilliant woman, showed that the RNA actually had some catalytic function of its own. That means that the RNA by itself could carry out this reaction over and over and over without changing the RNA in any way. So that essentially defined what a catalyst is just as you might define chemically a, a catalyst as lead when you added it to gasoline in the old days before lead was outlawed. Uh, the lead increased the combustion of gasoline uh, drastically. So in this case, the RNA uh, was very active in cleaving, the RNA of the enzyme was very active in cleaving another piece of RNA. So that was the truly revolutionary um, move, and uh, that really upset a notion that had been in place for perhaps 150 years. Well, not 150, maybe 120 years. That was uh, first enunciated by Pasteur when he was the first person to describe what an enzyme was. Mm -hmm. to isolate enzymes. Now, now going back to your earlier work as a postdoc, you, you essentially, because I read about that experiment and it sounded interesting, you were the, the first one to isolate an RNA uh, by uh, 
tracking it across a gel? Could you, that, that was a, a very understandable experiment, and, and it seems like it was a, an important step in what you later wound up showing. Well, other people had isolated RNA uh, of very stable RNAs that, are, that we knew were inside cells. Uh, but I succeeded in isolating a pure species of a tRNA that was radioactively labeled. Uh, I won't go into the labeling procedure or why we did it, but we were able to label the RNA with uh, P32, which is a common radioactive isotope in use at that time, still is for various ways, if, uh, in various ways. And um, all you had to do was put whatever mixture you had on a gel, which is essentially jello of uh, different composition and different uh, nature. And then you could put electrodes at either end of the gel, positive and negative, and run an electric field on a gel. And you knew what the charge of RNA was. It has a negative charge. And the RNA would run through the gel. And at a certain time, you would turn off the electric field, put a piece of saran wrap over the gel, and on top of that, put a uh, photographic film in a dark room, and wait a little while and develop the film. And you would see a dark band where the RNA was on the gel. Uh, and so we. Uh, I should say I succeeded in doing that, and some of my colleagues in the lab were um, quite interested in this. The next stage, well, that was circumstantial evidence that we actually had isolated a single species of RNA. The next stage was to extract that RNA from the gel, and if you put some perforations in the gel and in the film at the same time, you could put the film on the gel, and you could cut out that dark band from the gel, depending upon where it was in the film, and you could extract the RNA from that. And then you could do what is called fingerprinting the RNA, which is essentially a technique invented by Fred Sanger uh, to characterize the, the gel, the, excuse me, the pieces of RNA that you isolated. And fingerprint means that you had an, a, a unique identification of that RNA. And so there are several of my colleagues were anxiously awaiting this fingerprinting to know exactly what was going on. And I had to avoid them because I didn't want them hovering over me when I did this. Uh, and I developed the, the gel, and it was it showed what I hoped it would show. and. There were three or four of us who were pretty excited by that. And, and before we talk about that moment of excitement, uh, I, I want to emphasize for our audience, so the, the presumption before was that whatever catalytic activity RNA was engaged in was the result of uh, a protein that it carried. And this process, you, over time, were able to isolate it and demonstrate, no, that it was the RNA that was, was the catalyst. Yes. Uh, we took this piece of RNA that I just described, which was a tRNA precursor, and we made a crude extract of E. coli. E. coli is a small bacterium that grows in your gut, completely harmless unless it's in your bloodstream and you just broke it open in various ways. And you exposed that to this tRNA precursor and ran that on a gel. And instead of getting one band in a certain position, now you got two bands because it had been cut in one place. So the two bands indicated there was an activity there, which was the enzyme that cut the gel. So then we purified the activity. And ultimately, as you purify it, you want to get it to the point where you have, in principle, only one or maybe a couple of bands of protein, because that's what we thought was responsible for the activity. But when we ultimately purified it, we found one band of protein and one band of RNA, and subsequently we showed the RNA was the actual catalyst. So then what was the, what was it you're feeling like? What were you feeling when you realized, aha, 
it did this by itself to, to simplify it for our... Well, um, it put in place a lot of questions we had about the problem we were working on. We, we had various ideas that we published one time or another about what was happening. And this indicated that we finally understood the problem. Sort of as, uh, as if you were banging your head against the wall and suddenly you didn't have to bang your head against the wall because you understood it. And so that was very satisfying. And from then on, a series of experiments w were, was uh, suggested that we just carried out over the next few years. But uh, they weren't intellectually demanding experiments. We knew exactly what had to happen. But that one moment where we understood what the RNA was a catalyst was uh, the principal excitement in terms of uh, um, some confirmation of what we felt. But the fact was, it was sort of an anticlimax because it was a very difficult process to go through the previous five or six years when essentially we were pummeled from virtually every direction about even the statement that RNA was part of the enzyme. Mm. And that relaxed somewhat when other people found other particles that had RNA in them uh, that weren't catalytic, but they had RNA in them. And someone else tried to disprove our experiment by trying it in another bacterium, but in fact he showed that we were right. So I felt no pressure on that, but the final fact that we showed that the RNA was the catalyst was the, as I said, anticlimactic. Mm -hmm. and, and presumably during this number of years where you, what you were doing was being questioned, your street smarts from Canada <laughs> came into play uh, as you resisted or continued on your work uh, uh, despite the criticism? Yes, I think that's true. I, I can't say it was a happy time, uh, but I was damn sure that none of the guys out there, and I just edited the language I was going to use, none of the guys <laughs> out there was going to beat me down over this, because I, I knew what I did was correct. And one of my, uh, my first postdoctoral mentor, Matt Messelson, who was at Harvard, I met him at a meeting during this time, and uh, he said what was new, I told him what was new, and he said, you know, it's been very difficult because nobody believes this. And, hmm. and he, uh, he's another extremely self-confident, extremely intelligent person, also a student of Linus Pauling's. Uh, he said, well, you know, did you do all the necessary control experiments? Are you sure this has worked? You've done it many times. I said, we've done everything possible we could think of. It always gives the same result. We're sure that it's the case. He said, well, there's no problem at all. That's what nature is telling you. And then he said, and somebody else will repeat it, and then everything will be fine. And I thought afterwards that it was easy for him to say that because I knew that he was a very self-confident and uh, a self-assured person. And I said, well, maybe I'll believe the same at some point. But he was absolutely right. Uh, I read a quote that, uh, from you uh, uh, about, the, you were talking about creativity uh, or, uh, or the, this process. And you made an interesting point, which I would like for you to uh, restate, which is that not only did the, you solved your problem of banging your head against the wall, but also that it solved the problems of other people who are working in this area. I mean, in other words, that, that somehow you opened up doors that then made greater sense of a number of other problems. Well, that, that's certainly possible. And I should say that uh, Tom Check at the University of Colorado was working on a completely separate system. And uh, about a year before we published our data on the RNA as a catalyst, he, he came out with a very similar experiment in his system. Uh, so that there was a feeling now that there, that what, what we had published was probably true because uh, 
check had a similar, not identical, but a similar kind of result. And one thing I did say was that it would be obvious that many more different kinds of RNA would now be found because you just had to know how to look for them in a certain way. It had been that people only looked for RNAs that were very stable and present in large amounts in cells like ribosomal RNA which is involved in making protein and transfer RNA also involved in making protein. Uh, but if there was concrete evidence that there was RNA inside the cell, although in very small amounts, and you knew how to look for it, people would find it and that would really open up the field enormously. And in fact, that is exactly what happened. Now, the implications of, of this discovery, uh, let's talk about two of them. First, this has important implications for the treatment of disease. How, do, how does that work? Okay, that, that is a, a subsequent uh, finding we had, and it may or may not, it, it may turn out to be useful. Uh, what we found is that you, usually when you find an enzyme, you try and find out exactly how it recognizes the molecules that it acts on. What are the features of the structure that it acts on that are important. And we did that, and we showed that there was a small portion of these molecules that was recognized by the enzyme. And then we understood, and brilliant Australian postdoc did this in my lab, how you could reconstruct that small segment of RNA, two pieces of RNA, that looked just like what this enzyme recognized. And if the enzyme saw this, it would cut one of the pieces of RNA. And the RNA could be any RNA inside the cell, but you had to put another small piece of RNA that complexed with it in a specific way, and then the enzyme would see that and cut it. And the enzyme was inside all cells. It's an essential enzyme. So we did some experiments over the years in which we did put in pieces of RNA into cells uh, to target other RNAs that were either dangerous to the cells or essential to the cells. And we found that this always worked. The host ribonuclease P always cut the target RNA under these conditions. So you could say under those conditions, I should say you, you could say that in principle, we have a universal therapy, which is a very large statement, unlikely to be entirely true. But in fact, you can design this particular system to work under any conditions you like. And we've shown it's true in mammalian cells as well as many bacteria. The problem is getting that extra piece of RNA uh, inside cells. And we know how to do it Actually, we know how to do it pretty well inside bacteria at the moment. And the question is, will anybody pay attention to this? Will anybody with money want to invest into starting up a biotechnology company? <coughs> Excuse me. So that's where we are. Mm -hmm. And and then the, the, the second area which you touched on in your lecture is that your, your discovery sort of begins to help us grapple with the problem of the origin of life, basically, that, that it's put a new factor into the equation uh, to understand uh, uh, that <coughs> RNA may have been a key element in, in, in creating uh, life. Yes. Um, I, myself, did not uh, put that forward. Other people put it forward, and Tom Cech certainly put it forward also. But in 1967, Francis Crick and Leslie Orgel and Carl Woese published in separate papers that if we're thinking about the origin of life, it's a big puzzle because and nobody believed that protein was present at the origin of life because you can't transmit information in proteins. Uh, 
Uh, I won't go into that at the moment. Uh, and they each mention specifically that uh, there has been no enzymatic function ever shown for RNA, therefore we can forget about RNA at the moment. But if RNA had some enzymatic functions, it, it would open up the whole picture. So that because of Czech's discovery and essentially my discovery, uh, this created a big splash in terms of what people thought about the origin of life. And then there were uh, suggestions made that if you had RNA present, which has information, it could transmit that information, <clears throat> providing another piece of RNA could replicate the RNA. And if you had RNA that could proceed in terms of carrying out metabolic functions inside the cell, uh, then you could have a primitive cell with RNA. And that's logically correct, but it makes an assumption that scientists frequently make. Uh, that is to say, if you have one example that works, then you expand that to have all kinds of examples of that particular feature, uh, and you can say this will work. So the idea is if you had catalytic function that broke pieces of RNA, then you say, oh, you can say quite readily, then RNA can have all kinds of enzymatic functions or metabolic functions, and we can go on from there. And that essentially has been what people have talked about. Your, your work really points to the importance of basic research, because your discovery, uh, which in a way you weren't looking for, I think you're saying, but you knew where to look as it emerged, uh, uh, really is probably, and, it, and it's said to be, as revolutionary as the discovery of DNA itself. So, so make it. I don't agree with that, but oh, that, play, well, that, that's okay. Okay, but, uh, but so, so uh, I, I think it's important for our audience to understand, you know, the importance yeah. of basic research. You know, uh, you're absolutely you're right. right. You're absolutely right about that. Yeah, I, I wouldn't rate my discovery equal to some of the other great discoveries, but that's a separate issue. But you're absolutely right about basic research. I believe extremely strongly uh, that individuals are carrying out research without any specific idea about the utility of this research, uh, that, that has no bearing on what you're trying to find out or how you're going to try and find out it. The real bearing is just to solve another problem. It's to add something to our bank of knowledge as we do what we have to do. And I believe, as I indicated previously, that uh, individuals and perhaps small groups are the best possible arrangement for this. And not only that, it's absolutely essential for our government to support basic research. Now, there are some aspects of science where large groups are necessary, for example, high energy particle physics where you have to have large groups to build large accelerators. That's a separate issue, but the fact is the government has to believe that this is something that is worth doing. Now, if you're an economist, and I sh excuse me for saying it as my son is, uh, you can show quite readily that the future wealth of the country depends to a large extent on basic research in the sciences and in technology. And what we're doing today is a major factor in the future uh, prosperity of this country. And that isn't going to happen in the next few years. It might happen in 10 years from now or 20 years from that now. That is the payoff from That's the, right. right. The yeah. payoff will be 10 or 20 years from now. Unfortunately, politicians have a very short lifetime in what they see, but in fact, Congress is a large body of people, and there are some people who recognize that this payoff is worthwhile. So I would make a strong case for supporting basic research. And, and uh, are you concerned that now the, uh, 
the uh, U.S. is losing sight of uh, that uh, uh, principle. Uh, going back to the start of your career, the victory uh, in World War II, the role of science, the, the government really embraced the idea of, of basic science and there was public support for it. Well, I think that the view of science and technology has changed somewhat. We're still investing very heavily in science, although our lead in comparison to other countries is diminishing to some extent. And I don't want to speak for all of sciences right now. You know, if you press me, I will offer things that may or may not be true, I don't know. But in the biological sciences, there's been a big push on what is called translational research. Translational research is research that can be immediately applied in terms of clinical therapies. Now, obviously, we want to do that ultimately. We want uh, some of what we're doing to be relevant to the health sciences in, in a, a real fashion. And unfortunately, too many congressmen feel that's most important. But I think it's a mistake to characterize our research as translational research and not to give money if it's not translational research. That, in my view, is a very bad idea. And that's the idea which is prevalent now at, at the National Institutes of Health, where a statement is being made, if you're doing something that's relevant to translational research, the odds of you getting money are very high. Mm. So. I think we have to be careful about how these, these efforts are uh, managed and focused in different ways. Uh, in your career, you also served at, as a dean of Yale College. And I'd like to talk a little about that, because the other piece of this, beyond funding basic research, is training the next generation of scientists on the one hand, but also uh, graduating undergraduates who are familiar with science, uh, with science and can be informed citizens. Uh, talk about what you learned in that uh, uh, period as a dean and, and what you tried to do. Well, I was dean of Yale College from 1985 to 1989, so it's some time ago. And maybe the world has changed since then. But uh, prior to the time I was dean, I was chair of a committee at Yale College that reviewed the curriculum, the whole curriculum. Uh, one of the things we found out was that 30 percent of the students at Yale never took any science at Yale, zero, nothing. Another perhaps equal percentage took one course, but very few courses. So that meant that in terms of science, the students were being, in my view, shortchanged. Uh, so we reorganized the curriculum so that more, we, we recommended that the curriculum be reorganized so that students take a uh, science course at least. When I became dean, um, there was a very intelligent uh, person who served as the associate dean in terms of uh, uh, academic functions. His name was Martin Griffin and unfortunately he died three years hence after I became dean. And we decided if we wanted to do anything about science we would have to review again the whole curriculum and we did that. Ultimately we came up with a plan that all students, uh, let's say students not studying science or engineering, all students would have to take at least three courses in science before they graduated and presumably three courses in one area. So they'd get more than a, a f very rough familiarity with something. And that passed in the faculty. And of course, the deal was that if you were in science and engineering, you had to take at least three courses in the humanities, at least three courses in the social sciences, et cetera. So it was all balanced very nicely. But in fact, it then became the case that all students had to take at least three courses in science. And you could not use AP credit from high school or anything else you did in high school to satisfy that. I don't know that that's still required today, but it might be. 
And then one final question, how would you advise students to prepare for the future, if, especially if they want to be scientists? My advice generally is to find something you're interested in, science or otherwise, and study it seriously and carefully. And the final two words are work hard. Work hard is extremely important. Professor Altman, on that uh, note of encouragement, uh, I want to thank you for taking uh, your time from your busy schedule while you're on the campus to be on our program. Thank you. It was a very informative discussion. Thank you. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.